Springfield is in danger of being obliterated, and Homer is the great yellow hope in the Simpsons movie. I'm Richard Roper. Filling in for Roger this week is the film critic for the Chicago Tribune, Michael Phillips. Welcome back, sir. How's your summer, Richard? Uh, it's fantastic right. because I get to see movies like this one. All Let's right. get those thumbs in the air. Let's first up is The Simpsons Movie. This is the first big screen adventure for the animated stars of arguably the greatest TV comedy ever. This is essentially an 87-minute episode of the show, faithful to the familiar oh characters, God, the subversive themes, and of course, the politically incorrect humor, and I love it. The animation does seem a bit crisper and more richly detailed. <laughs> And there are a few PG-13 touches, including Marge invoking the Lord's name in vain, and oh my God, Bart flashes some full cartoonal nudity. Mostly, though, it's flat out funny. Let your spirit. What is it, Ned? The good Lord is telling me to confess to something. An immodest sense of pride in our community. Somebody else. When Homer dumps his pet pig's silo of waste into the lake, Springfield becomes a toxic nightmare. Albert Brooks voices the EPA official who presents the President of the United States with a few options. Knowing things is overrated. Anyone can pick something when they know what it is. It takes real leadership to pick something you're clueless about. Okay, I picked three. Try again. One. Go higher. Five. Too high. Three. You already said three. Six. There is no six. Two. Double it. Four. As you wish, sir. Uh, the option President Schwarzenegger chooses is to put a glass dome over Springfield and chaos reigns. When there's a massive power outage, not even Moe's is safe. Okay, very funny. Now I'm going to turn the lights off again. When they come back on, I want all my booze back the way it was. With the whole town turning on Homer, he makes an executive family decision. Now escape Springfield and find refuge in the country of Alaska. Oh, my boy loves Alaska so much, he's applauding it. Lisa, why aren't you clapping? But Dad... Clap for Alaska. Oh. And by the way, Homer's the one who thinks Alaska's a country. I realize, of course, it's a continent. Great. Do okay. Okay. Even if you've never seen the show, the story is self-contained enough that you'll appreciate the comic genius of the writing, the voice work, and the crude but very clever animation. However, this movie is really for the legions of loyal Simpsons fans, and I don't think they'll be disappointed. So for me, Michael, thumbs up. Yeah, a thumbs up for me, too. I okay. think, that, I mean, it's based on one of the great com uh, comedy series, in, you know, animated or human in history. Mm -hmm. And I guess if there's a slight air of disappointment, it's the fact that it's only consistently funny, that it's only one of the funnier comedies of 2007, and that it may not be quite as high up in the pantheon as the first few seasons. And actually, this whole environmental theme is played out very nicely. It's very funny, but it's a lot of sort of knowing chuckles instead of laugh out loud yeah. stuff. And, but it's what you get on the TV show. And I don't know what they could have done. Maybe that's the smartest move, because what do you try to do? You try to top yourself too much, and then people say, well, this isn't consistent with the show. Right, right. So it's I just like a really good, long version of, yeah. the, of the series. I guess, the, I guess the, the, the great surprise was something like the South Park movie, mm -hmm. was that it really took a jump they did. up from they the did. series, yeah. and really was the best, better than the series. I want to make sure that people understand, we're saying this is really funny, yep. this is very consistent to The Simpsons, it's just not where we're talking about, well, this is going to win the Adam, you know, Academy Award for Best Animated Film this right, year, I don't Right, right, right. No, it's, look, it's still, there's still the great voice of sort of the, the merry cynicism <laughs> that this country yeah. Yeah. really deserves. And, you know, it's deserved it for the, all 18 years it's been on the air, and they keep being sort of the voice yeah. of reason on all these things. And it's still definitely worth your money. Yeah, absolutely. We all imagine what other people might look like naked, but... <laughs> well, speak for yourself. Well, occasionally, anyway. But British director Sean Ellis, who was a fashion photographer before he was a filmmaker, turns this daydream into very serious, even noble pursuits in the new movie Cashback. It comes from a short film nominated for an Academy Award Nobody Ellis made three years ago. Sean Biggerstaff point. plays an art school illustrator works. recently dumped by his girlfriend. He and his pal debrief oh, over a cafeteria that. lunch. You need to go out with a beautiful girl, model or something. Why? Well, because if you've got a beautiful girl on your arm, then you must be worth having. <laughs> Women are in competition with each other, you see. Susie sees you with a sexy baby, she'll think to herself, if I can get Ben back from that beautiful girl, then I must be more beautiful than her. Thrown into a quagmire of insomnia, Ben takes a third shift job at a 24-hour supermarket. The there he can indulge in his artist's reveries on the subjects of freezing time and appreciating beauty. That moment. When you see someone walking down the street who is so beautiful you just can't help but stare. Well, imagine, as I do, that with the world on pause, it becomes very easy to understand the concept of beauty. 
There's very little human spark in this hyper-controlled universe. Either as comedy or anything else. Cashback is showing on HDNet movies. It's also in theaters and limited release and available on DVD. However you choose to see it, I'd have to go thumbs down. Yes. Thumbs up for me, Michael. Thumbs up. And you know what? First of all, a kid of that age with artistic ambitions, yes, yeah, sometimes he's going to sound very pretentious, even as he's just using his time-stopping device to uh, take the tops off women. That's the dichotomy you're going to get of a kid that age. The question also is, can he really freeze time, or is it just his imagination running wild? And, yeah. and I think that's an interesting element, and I, th I think it's got a beautiful look to it, and I think it's got a sweet romance at the heart of it, and it's also very funny at times. I like this film. Oh, no, gassy. I thought every time, that is one of the laziest sort of yuck, use of voiceover, and that, I mean, that is the most pseudo profundity kind of clogging up a, well, I, like any, that, any I like that you had yick and pseudo profundity in the same uh, hey, uh, sentence the, the my film, friend uh, you're, you're the appealing film manages all both, the film manages to go <laughs> both ways I think go rent art school confidential if you want, okay, you you know, know what? What? psychosexual angst that's worth looking at. I think at. this filmmaker has a future. Okay. I do. Well, I think you might too. Okay. <laughs> Later in the show, this summer's been filled yes, with yeah, three schools, but I think we've got the best the one of the He's summer by far. We'll review Matt Damon and the Bourne Ultimatum. And next, and Brenda Blethyn laughs till she cries in introducing the Dwights. Ladies and gentlemen, here she is. Clubland's raunchous homemaker, Miss Jeannie Dwight. You saw something there you shouldn't. Where's my spotlight? That's better. Spotlight on beauty. Next up is one of those quirky Australian comedies that's almost as charming and sharp as it thinks it is. Introducing the Dwights features a fiercely funny and sometimes brutally acerbic like performance it. from Brenda Blethyn. Oh, she plays no, Jeannie no, Dwight, a 50-ish working-class single mom who had a short it's dance so with no, fame as a body comic in Britain back like in the day. She still dreams of a comeback so and she's still hitting the club circuit, but she spends most of her waking and probably her sleeping moments fixated on the lives of her two sons. Um, it's me. So where are you? Oh. You know? No, I don't know. What am I, clairvoyant? Oh, out and about. Oh, well, that narrows it down. Jeannie sees her career spiraling down the toilet as her alcohol consumption rises to spectacularly horrible levels. Do you think I'm joking? I'll show you who's joking. Clear off, all of you. Come on out. Mark, move. Come on, piss off. This movie has its flaws. Jeannie's comedy is kind of terrible, leading one to wonder how she ever had any success. And the ending is a bit too sweet, though undeniably touching. It's an uneven film, but I am giving it thumbs up. That's a lot of caveats, buddy. I don't know. Thumbs down for me. Here's the thing. I think this is a film totally divided against itself. You have the Brenda Blethyn thing, which is more like a kind of a blousy actress's showcase. And I think yeah. she's she's one of these performers who always gives 110%. Every stop is always out. Yeah. I, I like Sometimes 90, you don't want 110%. Yeah, 95 yeah. is often the better number. Anyway, yeah. but there's one there's one segment of this film I really like, which is the young Hi. romance, the primary romance Hi. within it. But I that, agree. That, it never gets um, to take over the movie. And I I just find it very frustrating as a result. Yeah, this uh, Emma Booth who plays Jill, uh, she can cry like no actress I've seen in a long time. I mean, she's really good. So, so yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I agree with some of your criticism. I think there's just enough for me to recommend. I think Blevin likes the laughter through tears thing too, but like that line from Steel Magnolia, some people are very good at that sort of thing and love it a little too much. So for me, you know, this film kind of belongs down there with Steel Magnolias. Oh, yeah, that's a that's a bad place. Okay, <laughs> coming up next, Matt Damon stars in The Bourne Ultimatum, and later in the show, Siskel and Ebert and Roper and others coming soon. To to a computer screen near you. Oh, wait, where's your big red suit and beard, Santa? You just gave them a gift. Be sure to check out our new website for full-length video replays of each week's reviews 24 hours a day. Visit at TV.com, the online home of Ebert and Roper. Every time I laughed at one of your jokes, I was faking it. You're a monster! Okay, looking at movies now in theaters, I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry with Adam Sandler and Kevin James is Deadly, got a thumbs down. Interview with Steve Buscemi and Sienna like Miller, got a thumbs up. And No Reservations with Catherine Zeta-Jones and Aaron Eckhart, thumbs up. Don't forget to reduce the sauce a little, okay? You're crossing the line, sweetheart. Mm, no. Yes, you are. Mm -mm. Look, your spoon's in my territory. You know, Michael, this movie follows a formula we've seen in dozens of other romantic comedies, but they do it so well. I just enjoyed it every step of the way. Well, I hate to say it, the Germans did it better with Mostly Martha, because if you watch that film, mm. the film this is based on very closely, you can see the plotting worked out so much more satisfyingly there. So that's what I say. 
rent the other one. Well, I would agree that when it comes to cars and beer, anyway, the Germans do it better. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. This summer's been jammed up with threequels from Spider-Man 3 to Drek, sorry, Shrek the <laughs> Third. Now along comes the Bourne Ultimatum to turn three into a magic number. It opens next week. This is an early review, and I think this is a superbly kinetic thriller, the alleged final chapter in what's turned out to be an increasingly gripping franchise. It stars Matt Damon as novelist Robert Ludlum's amnesiac CIA assassin who spans the globe, bringing you a constant variety of chase. Near the beginning, Bourne, having survived various attempts on his life in Moscow, is on the run once again from his own people. Here, he arranges a meeting at London's Waterloo Station with an investigative reporter who's on to the story. You have no idea what you're into here. These people will kill you if they have to. Was it Blackbriar? Is that what this is? Black, what's Blackbriar? Treadstone upgrade. My source told me it all started with you. He said that you were square one, the dirty little secret. He said he knows who you are. With eye blink speed, the Bourne ultimatum zips from London to Madrid to other world capitals. Bourne, who's already coping with the assassination of his lover in the second film, intersects once again with a fellow CIA operative played by Julia Stiles. Why are you helping me? It was difficult for me. With you. You really don't remember anything. In Tangier, Bourne stays one step ahead of his latest would-be assailant and a few hapless Moroccan cops. The director of the Bourne Ultimatum is Paul Greengrass, who also directed the Bourne Supremacy. Joan Allen is back as Bourne's wary CIA tracker, whose boss, played by David Strathairn, wants to see Bourne dead, not me. Greengrass transforms some potentially ordinary material here into what I think is the fastest two hours of the summer. The Bourne Ultimatum makes the other studio thrillers of 2007 look mighty sluggish and politically naive by comparison. <laughs> Big thumbs up for me on this one. I like this. Well, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, Micah. Um, Greengrass is a master at these very complex scenes. There's one sequence, there must be 15 minutes with no dialogue. And oh, it's lots, just so lots of, lots perfectly of choreographed. And, and those great uh, up-close fight scenes that, uh, that Jason Bourne has with the Assassin of the Week, that kind of stuff. I love all that. I did think that it kind of repeated a lot of the things we saw in the second installment, and mm. up to and including who the bad guys are. And about the third or fourth time we got one of those great chase sequences, I'm like, okay, you know, let's keep going. And he's got a little bit of a diehard with a vengeance, yeah, John yeah. McClane uh, uh, immortality well, going here. here. No matter what happens yeah, yeah, to yeah. this guy, he can survive, you know, 50 foot falls and, and right. car wrecks, and he, you know, he, does one of these moves and he's back at yeah, it. You know, that's a little almost cartoonish. Increasingly James Bondian as it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what I love about what Greengrass oh. has done with the second one, and especially this third one, which I prefer to the second one even, okay. is that it, it almost becomes this kind of, uh, you know, very abstract riff on what a spy thriller yeah, yeah. is about as atmosphere. And I, I agree think with that. And I think yeah. you do get a kind, of a, kind of a great <laughs> sense of America as as a country tangled up in its own craziness about surveillance. Yeah. And also, it's great that you see all that kind of upended by one super spy. Yeah, yeah. So, well, you mentioned, you know, the James Bond franchise. And you look at Daniel Craig in Casino Royale or Matt Damon in these movies. This is award-worthy acting that never gets that kind of uh, talk when we get into what's going to get nominated for Oscars because it's an action movie, it's a spy thriller. That's not considered serious enough. But these guys are great. Yeah, I would Matt say, Damon's terrific in this movie. Yeah, I would say Craig really gave a performance and had the space in that performance to really show off what he could do. Damon's role in this is a lot more limited. He has his moments of, you know, the little dalliance with Julia Stiles, his back, his cat and mouse with, with Joan Allen. Yeah. I mean, he has his scenes. He has a chance to show his chops yeah, here yeah. as but well. I, th yeah. I think what, what the green grass for me is a guy who he has to watch out for, for playing into this particular style too much. For now, though, I think these things, he's really selling what is basically kind of ordinary spy material beautifully. And I agree with you. I'd love to see the Jason Bourne character come back at least one more time. All right, let's see it. Okay, our next movie is sure to get Sean Hannity's blood boiling, but I'd like to believe liberals and conservatives alike would understand why No End in Sight is essential viewing for any patriot. Working with the passionate yet fact-based precision of a prosecutor assembling a major case, filmmaker Charles Ferguson gathers witnesses and produces overwhelming evidence arguing that the war in Iraq is a tragic quagmire. We hear from journalists and government insiders who were there and were stunned by the lack of big picture planning. Larry Dorita addressed us in one form and said by the end of August of 2003, we will have all but 25 to 30,000 troops out of Iraq. I heard him say that in a room full of people. And I turned to my 
colleagues, and I said, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. It's physically impossible. This is a devastating indictment of the Bush administration. Now, you might say, because I'm a liberal, of course I love this film. No, I love this film because I love my country, and it's heartbreaking to see American soldiers and Iraqi civilians die week after week, month after month, year after year. This is an excellent, sobering documentary, and it's the opposite of the Michael Moore tactic. I think this guy Absolutely is right. Ferguson very shrewd about getting all the right people on camera, you know, not to talk about the rationale for the war, but just how it all went wrong step by step. Yeah, fascinating and, and very, as you said, very sobering stuff. Okay, coming up next, a Scorsese classic takes on new relevance, plus the best graphic novel perhaps ever put on film in the Thumbs Up video segment. But first, Here's a look at what's coming up on next week's show. Do you, Hector? He does. Hector, say I do. I do. You're like the coolest person that's ever talked to me, and I blew it. Come on, you didn't blow it. I think maybe you got... This week's Thumbs Up videos are brought to you by Raisinets. Make a deliciously smart choice with Raisinets. If you don't love me, then I don't want to live. Just stop it. Okay, looking at movies new on DVD, all getting a thumbs down. Lonely Hearts, Perfume and Firehouse Dog. I do have a couple of picks though, Michael. Right now in Chicago, there's the Family Secrets Mob Trial. Fascinating mm -hmm. stuff. And Martin Scorsese's 1995 film Casino is a fictionalized right. version of some of the events that are being talked about in the Family Secrets trial, including the Spalatro murders, which became the Santoro murders in the film. Yeah, I love Casino. I think it's a great examination of Vegas in the 70s and 80s before the big corporations took over. And I'm also recommending 300, mm. which still has the most memorable line of 2007. But tonight, we died in hell! <laughs> so, two movies for you on DVD. Yeah, and I, well, I, I would recommend people watch 300 <laughs> on their ancient Greek Xbox. That's, that's, the, best, that's the best format of that It's a good film. Not a terrible film, one. but... Uh, good film. My video pick this week is Hot Fuzz. Director and co-writer Edgar Wright's droll mashup of rogue cop movie cliches <laughs> and an Agatha Christie whodunit. Hot Fuzz comes from the Shaun of the Dead gang, and co-writer Simon Pegg is wonderful as a buy-the-book copper whose new village is full of bloody secrets. Mr. Skinner, what you do with your land is of no concern of mine, so... The movie settles for a little too much straight-ahead bad boys-style violence in the later sequences, but a lot of Hot Fuzz is truly hilarious. It's great. Check it out. I agree. So Hot Fuzz and 300 will be in stores on Tuesday. Casino is available right now. And when we come back, I'll tell you how you can chat live with Roger Ebert. Close captioning for Ebert and Roper is sponsored by... Man has evolved to the point where he no longer needs to stand in line for tickets. The movie tickets card available only at movietickets.com. Guests of Ebert and Roper stay at the Peninsula Chicago, the city's most exciting luxury hotel, located in the heart of Chicago's magnificent mile. If you've been watching our show for some time, you're probably aware this program has quite a history. Dating back to 1975 when Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel first sat across the aisle from each other, reviewing and often debating and often battling about the merits, or lack thereof, of new feature films. Oh, much better. on, I'm not wrapping myself in the flag of children. You're wrapping yourself in the flag of the sophisticated film critic. No, boredom. Seen it all. No, boredom. Boredom with Benji running. Sadly, many of those very early shows were just lost or destroyed over the years. However, here's the good news. A complete collection of the last 20 years like does exist. I'm extremely pleased to announce we're launching an online archive of those reviews, as well as special theme shows that have been produced over the last two decades. At my first Chicago Film Festival in 1967, I reviewed your first film, and I predicted in that article that you would be a great director, and boy, was I right. <laughs> the Balcony Archive will launch this Thursday, August 2nd. It contains over four thousand reviews. This is the most extensive collection of video-based film reviews that exist anywhere in the world. It's searchable by movie, director, or actor. Mm -hmm. Now to properly get this archive off the ground, we needed just one tour guide and we have them. Roger Ebert will be hosting a live online chat this Thursday to introduce the archive and to answer any questions you may have. You can join him live on our website at themoviestv.com this Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central, five pacific for this very special presentation and while you're there you can check out the balcony archive you know we're even going to have some clips of some of my favorite reviewers from this year like you know christy lemire 
and uh, Robert Walonsky. You know, some of my, my real favorites. Uh, and you as well, my friend, of course. But the video archive, great. Just for the fashion statements alone, I can't wait <laughs> to see what Roger and Gene were wearing in the say, late 80s. I would say know? they were more question marks than statements, <laughs> but you're right about that, my friend. Okay, let's recap the movies on this week's show. Two thumbs up for The Simpsons movie. We split on Cashback. We also split on Introducing the Dwight. Two big thumbs up for The Bourne Ultimatum. It opens next week. And two very big thumbs up for no end in sight. Thanks again. As always. Hope to see you again. I hope so too. That's it for this week. Until next week, the balcony is closed. Now, Dr. Scholz has combined two gels to create an insole so outrageously comfortable, America is totally gelling. Are you gelling yet? Dr. Scholz. Get in. Net Zero gives you the fastest surfing available over dial-up and virus protection starting at $9.95. Try it risk-free for 30 days with our money-back guarantee. From Jennifer Convertibles, a Simmons microfiber sofa bed, just $2.99. Only at Jennifer, $2.99. Jennifer Convertibles, the only place to buy a sofa bed. Lumineers, the porcelain veneers that transform your smile. Lumineers have dramatically changed my life. For a free information packet, call 877-LUMINEERS.